Well, again, welcome to another edition of Crop Life Retail Week. I'm Eric Sulagoy here again with my compadre, Richard Jones, who I guess uh, has just returned from a long jaunt, but we'll get to that in a few minutes. But Richard, welcome back to at least Ohio. As you can tell, I'm in the office because with all my travel here in the month of March, I, uh, I have not been in the office yet. I had to change my calendar this morning from February to March. Uh, and uh, given my upcoming travel schedule uh, and, and a, a five-day waiting period between trips, I won't be again in, again in again until around April Fool's Day. So uh, yeah, what are you going to do? It's, it's the strange ways of travel in 2022. Yeah, we're, we're all coming and going, and it, it is kind of flipped around with you in the office and me at home this week, just getting back from a trip. But uh, um, it's, it's good to see you here, at least. And uh, maybe next month I'll get to see you in person. That'd be nice. I was going to say, one of these days, I, I mean, I know I know. at one point uh, last summer, uh, you know, my, my former compadre, Paul, and I actually ended up in studio uh, recording be behind the green screen uh, or in front of the green screen, I'm sorry. And uh, yeah, one, one would hope that eventually you and I will be able to utilize Studio M, which is our in-house studio that we've uh, used for years and years and years until COVID came around and basically... Uh, I don't know. I suppose it's a warehouse now. I'm not sure. I haven't been down there in a while. I think I think it's set and we're waiting for us when we get back. I'm predicting early April we'll, we'll be in person to do that. That that would be nice. Yeah, I know. I noticed that my grocery store has finally dropped the mask mandate, so I can actually shop for groceries and breathe the air without fogging up my glasses, which is very. Nice. <laughs> Hopefully, we're we're getting near the the end of the of the worst of the year, so start to get back to real normal. Yeah, one would hope. So Richard, I guess to start out our video this week, uh, now that we've made some chit chat, I uh, wanted to focus a little bit on transportation. Uh, this is gonna be the common theme of the next two items I'm gonna talk about. Uh, as you know, of course, we've been talking a lot about the Russia-Ukraine conflict and of course what that is doing for and to the world markets, uh, particularly when it comes to grains. Um, you know, the Ukraine actually provided, as we pointed out in a video not too long ago, about 10% of the world wheat uh, supply and took care of about 17% for corn. And with the uh, attacks in uh, Ukraine by the Russian troops, um, the Black Sea ports, which is where the Ukraine has been shipping uh, about 99% of the grain it sends out of the country using ships, have been closed. So, but we did find out this week that the uh, Ukrainian railroads have said that uh, they're going to be able to start moving some grain out of the country using rail cars instead. Um, they're estimating that they'll be able to ship about 150 grain carriage, carriages per day uh, to countries like Romania and Poland and Hungary so that, that uh, those products can then uh, get out to the rest of the world, in particular Europe. So again, we'll see if that helps the situation a little bit. Um, I know that this morning I was looking at wheat prices and uh, they were not, about a month ago, it was about $7 per bushel for wheat. And today it's uh, pushing $14 per bushel. So, and again, that's because of uh, what uh, people are anticipating is gonna be a short all in grain output coming from the Ukraine. Yeah, it's 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 amazing to see some of these numbers shooting up. Uh, understandably, with that situation there, uh, as terrible as it is, and and just the uncertainty about what we're going to be able to to get out of there or how we're going to manage through this. A terrible thing, and it, it has impacts in in so many other ways than than you would just think from watching the news, which is bad enough. Yeah. 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 So now, and along these lines, of course, you may remember a video two ago, I had up a slide, which I guess we'll probably put back up on the screen right now, where I was talking about world potash capacity, where it pointed out that Russia and Belarus accounted for about 34% of the world potash capacity combined. And that, uh, you know, we mentioned with sanctions and uh, other uh, economic considerations that perhaps that supply would not be available to the uh, to the US market, um, but I also did point out in that video, and you'll see with the pie chart, that Canada was actually our largest supplier of potash, about 36%. Um, so I 
you know, speculated that we would be okay because there would still be some supply available. Well, lo and behold, I ran across a story that Canada's largest union, railway union, has authorized 3,000 of its workers to uh, strike on March 16th, uh, unless they can get some concessions from their employer. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, as you might imagine, that would severely impact the ability of that uh, potash supply that normally comes from Canada to make it into the United States here in the spring season. So again, Richard, another, another black swan potential event showing up on the horizon, which could really, really disrupt the uh, fertilizer uh, capacity that is available for egg retailers and grower customers here in the spring season. So uh, you would know you would know better than I about how common some of these things are, but they do seem to be uh, fairly black swanish. Uh, that things just keep popping up one after another after another that you wouldn't expect. And every time we think we see a solution, something else pops up. So hopefully they can resolve that. Yeah, I, I have a feeling, you know, if we're here, knock on wood, 10 years from now, when we're writing back, looking at a historical perspective of 2020 to like the 2022, 2023 timeframe, I, I suspect that uh, the subhead on that chapter would be black swans aplenty, because <laughs> there uh, have been way too many abnormal events that have popped up over and over again. And again, you know, in this situation, I mean, the railway workers, uh, obviously, uh, you know, I'm sure they're paying attention and they realize that, uh, you know, given circumstances, their uh, their bargaining power may be as strong as it's going to be. So why not uh, why not authorize a potential strike coming up here in a week and uh, and see if they can get a better agreement from uh, from the folks involved? Well, that's the the one thing with all these things popping up is that uh, the good thing is though I know that you and the crop life team are going to be all over this and really focused on what retailers can do to, to respond to these things and help their grower customers. So um, just anxious to see how this shakes out. Yeah. Well, again, we'll talk about it. I'm sure, like I say, March 16th coming up in about a week. So we'll be able to hopefully have an update and uh, hopefully it'll be a positive thing that uh, this was just uh, a threat that never came to pass. So, mm -hmm. so I guess, uh, Mr. Richard, as you pointed out, you're actually uh, quarantining at home because you were out in sunny California at uh, one event that our uh, our friends here at Meister Media were hosting. So you want to fill in our viewers on uh, where you were, what you saw, and what you heard. Sure. No, it, was a, it was a great week. We were out in Monterey, California, and, uh, uh, just in the Salinas Valley area uh, for the first uh, event that we've been able to do in the biocontrols market in a couple of years. Uh, it was the Biocontrols USA Conference and Expo for 2022. Uh, they mentioned this before here, but the the last biocontrols event was literally about the last thing that anybody was able to do. We we were meeting in March of 2020, right before everything kind of happened. So, um, yeah, we left that event, and uh, two or three days later, the world kind of turned around. But it was great to be back in person. Really great to be back in person to have a, a really good conference and expo. Have a lot of people show up. People were definitely hungry for information on what's happened. You know, we haven't been able to meet in person in two years, but the developments in the biologicals industry have kept coming. Um, it, there's a lot happening. Uh, there was a lot to talk about on both the crop protection side, the, the plant nutrition side, the soil health side, sustainability in general, um, a focus on how ag technology is coming to bear on all these things and starting to help us understand how to use biologicals more efficiently and effectively. Um, we had uh, uh, 300 people come to the event. Um, including a lot of walk-up uh, folks were just driving in for the day. They saw the program and came in for a couple of days. So a lot of great networking was happening. Um, the, the expo floor was was packed pretty much start from start to finish. Met some some loyal retail lead viewers there. So that was that was nice to see. Um, and uh, just it was it was again great to be back in person and hearing from some of these companies really focused on developing these new biological products finding out just details on how they work, seeing some great trial data, um, uh, a really good week overall. I was gonna say, Richard, I know, I, I think I remember hearing in one of our company meetings, there were about 30 uh, tabletop exhibitors at the mm -hmm. event. Um, was Did there seem to be a, an overriding theme uh, when you were talking about, to, talking to those folks about their products? I mean, was it 
Was it uh, you know an effort towards educating the uh, end market on what the products are doing? Was it some type of new technique, uh, you know, method for delivery that was over you know the the the, the key trend? I mean, what what were the folks? What what seemed to be the the grand theme for everybody who was there? You know, one one kind of theme that came up a, a few times that I thought was really interesting was um, while well, we're seeing. Uh, Obviously, we're seeing a lot of new crop protection products, but we're seeing more look uh, at, at uh, biostimulant products. We're seeing some, some biofertilizer products, other angles besides just the crop protection, which is, again, uh, a great development to see. Um, but uh, uh, kind of a description of, of the process as kind of a, a general continual improvement. Um, uh, some of the discussion we had was on products that may have been launched five, six years ago, and somebody tried it and, and maybe didn't have quite the results they expected. And so they, they might look and say, well, that product doesn't work. But uh, we're talking about that product five years down the road, and there may have been three or four updates to that product since then, continual refinement, continual improvement. Um, and they continually to learn how to use these products better, produce them better. Uh, one of the speakers uh, described it as, you bought an iPhone, how many iPhone uh, updates have you had in the last three or four years? A lot. Very good point. Yeah, very these good. Products point. are the same thing. It's 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 just continually getting better on these products. So um, I thought that was an interesting perspective, and certainly true of a lot of the stuff that we saw there. Okay. All right. Well, interesting. So yeah, I'm sure that uh, I I don't uh, I don't think you get any video, but I'm sure there were some photographs taken that we'll be having either online or in the in the magazine coming up in mm -hmm. uh, next couple of weeks. I imagine. So we'll provide a recap, and then uh, we had. Uh, a, uh, a really good field tour while we were out there, visited some of vegetable and vineyard and greenhouse and, and other facilities. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be sharing uh, a really cool slideshow of that, I think, uh, maybe in this week's newsletter. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be watching for that and our viewers, I'm sure, will find it very fascinating to see some of the, uh, the people who were there at the event uh, for themselves. So Definitely encourage you to come check it out next time. Very good. Well, actually, while we're, we're recording this, I haven't left yet, but by the time this video airs, I'm going to be in the middle of the 2022 Commodity Classic, which will be taking place uh, here March 10th through the 12th in, down in New Orleans, Louisiana. So um, I know that uh, obviously uh, it looks like Tom Vilsack, the Secretary of Agriculture, will be there. So I'll try to get a video up uh, in our next our next uh, get a, uh, go around talk, you know, uh, reviewing a little bit about what he said and uh, what he was telling the folks gathered at that event. Um, and I know going into this meeting, obviously I haven't been there yet, but it looks like you, you had mentioned technology and it looks like technology is gonna be an uh, overriding theme here at Commodity Classic in 2022. I know already the uh, John Deere folks will be uh, talking about their sea and spray technology. And uh, it looks like uh, the folks at Raven are going to have an update on their OmniPower uh, autonomous spreader vehicle that will be uh, debuting at the event. And also it's not uh, the ag retail market, but it's agriculture. Uh, the folks at New Holland are, uh, are going to be previewing a methane powered tractor at uh, their booth at Commodity Classic. And again, the reason I bring that up is usually these type of technologies when they uh, show up in the tractor market uh, a couple of years down the line you start seeing uh, the potential technology also show up in sprayers and spreaders so we'll uh, we'll have to see you know we'll have to see what happens there but again i'll have a report next week with some video uh, about what was seen and heard at the uh, 2022 commodity classic so well, that'll be exciting i know we, we we talk a lot about especially in this market we talk about precision as as the technology but there's so much happening outside of just the, the precision stuff that's happening at the field level on the ag technology that's happening out there. It's really exciting. So I'm anxious to see uh, what you discover and what you bring back. Yep. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it myself. So, well, all right, Richard, it's time for your favorite segment of the show. <laughs> it's go. time for fun with numbers. Right. So now, Richard, I will say that we're adding a twist, uh, you know, in deference to your fans who have been apparently bombarding you with hundreds of thousands of emails about uh, giving you a better, 
more fair chance to get fun with numbers correct, we're going to do this one as a uh, multiple choice. All right. I'm going to hit you with a question. Okay. And then you will have four different options to pick from. Okay. And then before I give the correct answer, I'll explain. If you did get the right, right answer, I'll give you props, but I'll also explain what the false answers represent. So you'll catch a theme there as well. All right. So, okay, this is, we, we talked a little bit about historical perspective earlier in the video. So this one goes back. This, is, this comes from a friend of mine, Terry Kipley, at the uh, Council of uh, Producers and Distributors of Agrotechnology, who I uh, talked to about a week ago. Uh, he shared this little tidbit with me, and uh, I thought our viewers would find it interesting. So uh, in 1976, Richard, how many pesticide labels in the market called for the use of an adjuvant in their application? And your choices are okay. three, okay. 21, okay. 64, okay. or 300. In 1976. 1976. All right. I'm just going to work through my logic in that. Uh, 300 sounds like a lot. Um, 76 seems like a long time ago. And so I'm going to take the lowest number. I'm going to go with three. You are correct, my friend. Well, <laughs> well done. Multiple yes, choice three, is a great thing. Only three products in 1976 required adjuvant use on their pesticide labels. That was glyphosate, paraquat, and atrazine. Those were the uh -huh. only three. Now, just to kind of give you the update, here in 2022, there are over 500 pesticide labels that require the use of adjuvants. So industry's come a long way in 46 years. Sure has. So, and again, the false numbers, the ones you did not get, the theme there would be sporting and ga gaming. Um, 21, of course, is blackjack. That's what you need to win when you're playing cards in Las Vegas. 64 is the number of teams that will be in the NCAA tournament, which will be coming up here in about a week. And I'm sure many office pools will be anxiously watching to see if their team uh, is winning so they can get the pot. And then 300, of course, is a perfect game in bowling. So. Well, I'm glad I didn't get sucked into any of those other numbers, but... Uh... <laughs> Like so your your fans should be pleased. So with multiple choice, you absolutely uh, you you nailed it. Three is the correct <laughs> answer. So congratulations. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, Richard, I guess that does it for this edition of Crep Life Retail Week. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, sir. If you have questions or comments about today's episode of Retail Week, contact us by email or Twitter or type your message in the comment section below. Your feedback is important to us. We will try our best to address your thoughts in next week's episode and be sure to subscribe.